Fun for the Secret Seven by Enid Blyton. One day, towards the end of the holidays, the Secret Seven held a special meeting because a school friend of Jack's was very worried about something and wondered if the Secret Seven could help him. So, as Colin, Pam, George, Barbara, Jack and Peter and Janet sat round in the meeting shed with their dog Scamper, Bob, feeling very honoured to be invited to a Secret Seven meeting, explained his problem. And I've come to you because I'm very worried about old man Tolly who lives in the tumble-down house at the top of the hill. You mean the old man with that old dog and the lovely brown and white horse? Yes. Mr Tolly lives in one room and his horse, Brownie, lives in the other. Goodness, that's strange. Not really. Mr Tolly loves that old horse. Mr Tolly has been working for Mr Jenniford, the farmer, on the other side of the hill. And he and Brownie have been together all the time. Then one day, Brownie was pulling a heavy cartload of stones down the hill. And the weight made the cart run too quickly, and it ran into the horse and lamed his back legs. So he wasn't any use for work any more. What happened then? Well, the farmer said that as the horse couldn't work, he wasn't going to buy food for him. So the horse would have to be shot. Well, that's, that's, that's horrible. horrible. Oh, that's horrible. Well, Tolly was heartbroken. He was sure that Mr Whistler the vet could make the horse's legs right again. And he called him in. Good for him! Well, it wasn't. The farmer wouldn't pay the vet's fees, though the horse was his, and told the vet to send the bills to Tolly. And they came to over £100. Goodness! Surely Tolly couldn't pay all that? No, of course he couldn't, because apart from his pension, he can only really do odd jobs. He's old, you see, so he doesn't earn very much. Now he's really ill with worry. I was with him yesterday. My mother likes him, and she sent me up with some eggs for him. He told me all about it and showed me the vet's bills. Will old Mr Tolly have to go to prison if he can't pay? I don't know. I really don't know. Have you come to us for advice? Is there something you want us to do? Well, I simply don't know what I can do to help. And I thought the Secret Seven might have some ideas. How can old Tolly pay that bill? Where can he put the old horse now, so that Mr Dinneford won't take him away and have him shot? I just wondered if you Secret Seven could help somehow. Well, I'm willing to empty my money box to help pay the vet's fees. Then that mean old farmer, Mr Dinneford, can't complain about those. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I'll empty my money box and pay the bills. No, I think the first thing to do is find somewhere to keep the horse safely away from that horrid Mr Dinneford. Yes, Pam's right. Pam's absolutely right. We must get that horse out of the farmer's reach, if possible. That would be easy if we knew where he could live. He's a big horse and would need a decent stable, not a shed. Peter, wouldn't Dad let us have a place in one of his stables? Just for the time being. Dad wouldn't charge a penny, I know. Good idea, Janet. But remember... If we take that old horse away and stable him here, that horrid Mr Dinneford might accuse us of stealing his horse. Yes. What can we do then? We've simply got to do something. Well, we could find out how much the farmer wants for the horse and see if we can possibly earn enough money ourselves to pay for him. We've all got money boxes and if we haven't got enough, we can jolly well earn some more. What's the use of the Secret Seven if they can't tackle a thing like this? I knew the Secret Seven would do something. I think you're great. I really do. <laughs> That's all right, Bob. We're all glad you came to us. We shall need your help too. You can't be a member of the Secret Seven, but you can certainly be a helper in whatever we do with this problem. Yes, we shall need all the help we can get. Thank you. You can count on me, Peter. Right. Now... I'll ask my father to let us have a stall in one of the old stables. Bob, you find out exactly how much those vet bills are. And we can ask the vet if he would take something off the fees, 
so there won't be so much to pay. Whatever the bills come to, old Tolly won't have enough to pay, I know that. We want someone to clear up our orchard. I'll ask Dad to get old Tolly to do it and pay him. That'll help, George, and I'm sure you'll all think of something super by tomorrow. I wish I had your brains. You've got something better, Bub. A kind heart. They all agreed, and out came buns and ginger beer and chocolates and biscuits, which the Secret Seven had brought along. And when the little feast was over and Scamper had snuffled up every spare crumb, the meeting broke up and everyone went their way. They all had a lot to think about that night. At exactly ten o'clock the next morning, there came a number of raps on the Secret Seven shed door. The password, which was Scamper, was whispered through the door, and Scamper, who was inside with Peter and Janet, cocked his ears with pleasure every time he heard his name. He gave little whimpers of delight as the seven filed in and took their places. When Bob arrived, they all sat round facing Peter. The meeting has now begun. Well, everyone, first of all, I'm pleased to say my father was sorry for Mr. Tolly and said that the farmer, Mr. Dinnyford, was very hard hearted. Yes, he's a he's nasty horrible man. man. He's a horrible man. Really He said Mr. Tolly can keep Branny in our stable. And he won't charge him anything. That's good. That's good. That's really good. But he did think Janet and I should keep the stables clean ourselves, so that our own stable man won't have to do extra work. Yes, and we can all take turns. I'd like to take my turn too, if the Secret Seven don't think I'm butting in. Secret Seven, I propose we make Bob a temporary member until this matter is well and truly settled. Here, here, here. Now, Bob. Have you found exactly how much the vet's bill is? Um, well, thank you for making me a temper... temper... temporary... whatever it is, member of the Secret Seven. Yes, I went to Mr Whistler, the vet, and I asked him straight out how much Mr Tolly owed. What did he say? Well, he first of all asked why I wanted to know. I told him we were sorry for Mr Tolly because he was afraid the horse would be shot if the bills weren't paid. I told him we were trying to get some of the money pretty soon, if he wouldn't mind waiting for it. What did he say? He was very decent, and said he didn't know that Mr. Tolly would have to pay, and he said he would reduce the bill by half, and I was to tell Mr. Tolly not to worry, and he'd still go on seeing the horse and not charge him a penny more. That was marvellous of him. Did you tell him we would pay the bill ourselves, if he let us have time to earn the money? Yes, I did, and he looked so astonished that I was sure he didn't believe me. He asked me what on earth we thought we could do to earn that much money. Even if he halved the bill, there would be nearly eighty pounds to pay. He said Brownie's legs had needed daily attention, and that is why the fees were so high. They came to one hundred and fifty pounds, and half of that would be seventy-five pounds. What did you say? I said we would talk it over at the Secret Seven meeting, and I'd let him know what we could do. Then he told me that the boy who delivers animal medicines for him wants two weeks' holiday, and I could take his place if I wanted to. I can earn one pound fifty a night, so in fourteen nights I can earn. Um, um... <laughs> you are never very good at figures, Bob. That's twenty-one pounds exactly. The only thing is, I have to do choir practice one evening a week, and don't worry, I'll do that evening for you, Bob. Gosh. Fancy being able to knock off a quarter of the vet's bill like this! Good for you, Bob. You did well. Thanks, Peter. Although I must say I like being a temp, temp, tempany, whatever it is, member of the Secret Seven. <laughs> <laughs> the next morning, Peter and Janet set off with Scamper to Mr. Tolly's, as they wanted to tell him what Bob and the Secret Seven were going to do to try and save his old horse. When they approached the little white tumble-down cottage, they were met by Mister Tolly's nice but ugly little mongrel dog, Codger, barking fiercely. Who was this daring to go to his beloved master's house? He barked round their ankles as the children got nearer. Don't take any notice of his barking. He's behaving like a good watchdog, isn't he, Scamper? Right, little dog. Take us to your master then. Quiet, Codger. We're friends.、Oh, well, come in, Peter, and you, Janet. I'm just having a bit of a rest. That hill gets steeper and steeper. 
Oh, hello, Scamper. We're old friends, aren't we? Hello, Miss Tully. Hello, Miss Tully. I see you've made friends with Codger, Janet. Fourteen years old he is, and as good as any five-year-old. Yes, he really is a fine little dog. And such a nice face, too. Aye, he's a good and loyal little fellow and a real true friend. My old horse, Brownie's a good one, too. I'm a lucky man, I am. I've got the two best friends a man can have. A horse and a dog. Well, come with me, and I'll show you my horse, Brownie. Oh, he's lovely. He really is, Mr. Tolly. I love the way he nuzzles about you. Oh, he knows I'll have a biscuit in my pocket. Don't you, Brownie? I shan't forget you, Codger, don't you worry. And here's one for you too, Scamper. So you like my brownie, dear children? Oh, yes, Mr. Tolly, very much. All I worry about is that I might lose him. I'm not just about the farmer taking him. There's horse thieves about too, I'm told. Yes, I saw something about it in the local paper. But Brownie can come and live in our stables if you'd like him to, Mr. Tolly. He'd be safer there. And you can come with him too, Mr. Tolly, and bring your little dog, Codger. You can have the shepherd's old hut. He's not using it. Oh, do come, Mr. Tolly. Well, I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> Dad says it will be perfectly all right for you to come. Well, I'll be... Oh, I reckon old Brownie will be safe down in your father's stable. And, oh, I'll sleep alongside him for a bit. Maybe your dad has a few jobs I can do. I don't like working for that, Mr. Dinneford. He's a hard man he is to both man and beast. He was going to shoot old Brownie who'd worked for him for years just because he hurt his back legs when working for him. Well, you needn't worry any more. Yes, but, but Brownie's really Mr. Dinneford's, not mine. Although I've looked after him for years. And night broke my heart when that heavy-loaded cart ran into him. Don't you worry now, Mr. Tolly. When you are all with us, the vet can come and see Brownie's legs and make sure they get better. The vet? Mr. Whistler? Well, Mr. Dinneford told me I'd go to prison if the vet's dead isn't paid, and who'd look after Brownie and Codger then? Mr. Dinneford would have Brownie shot to save fodder. How much money would Mr. Dinneford ask for Brownie? Because Janet and I are thinking of buying him. What? Are we? I mean... Oh, oh, yes. You? Buying him? <laughs> no, Peter. I think he'd cost more than you and your sister could pay. We've saved quite a lot... But we couldn't pay more than £100 between us. I reckon Mr. Dinneford would ask more than that. Oh, dear. Anyway, my friends and I are going to help pay the vet's bills. Mr. Whistler has been very kind to let us off half of it. We haven't got the money yet, but we're earning some. Bob will earn £21 in two weeks working for Mr. Whistler. I thought I'd tell you about it now to save you worrying. Well, I'm... <laughs> I don't know what to say. And Dad says if we muck out the stable and keep it clean when Brownie comes, he'll provide free fodder. And the others are thinking up ideas. So don't you worry, Mr Tolly. We're sure to get the money for the vet. And Brownie will be safe in our stables. And we'll be happy with the other horses too. I can't believe what you're saying. I heard your father was a good, kind man, and it certainly has got children like himself. Right. I'll leave Brownie with you... And come and sleep in the stables at night for a bit. I'd better work out a week's notice with Mr. Dinneford, or he'll be after me. But I won't say a word about Brownie being with you in case he comes after him. All right. Come on, then. Let's take Brownie and show him his new home. And you, Codger. And Scamper. And, of course, you, Mr. Tolly. Brownie settled in very well and was soon nibbling at the fodder in his stall. Later that day, when the children were cleaning the stables and old Tolly was working at Mr Dinneford's, Peter and Janet's father phoned the local police sergeant to tell him what had happened, just in case Mr Dinneford complained that his horse had been taken without his permission. Apparently Dinneford was going to shoot it, and I'm willing to buy it off him to save it being shot. I suppose I should get a vet in to say what he's worth at the moment, in case Dinneford makes a fuss and puts an enormous price on it. Would be best, sir. If you like, I'll get our police vet to come over. He looks after police horses and is in the area this week. I'll get him to come over tonight. Would you? That would be most helpful. Much appreciated. I'll see him this evening, then. Thank you, Sergeant. Pleasure, sir. Good day, Jim. That evening, the police vet examined Brownie from head to tail, shoulders to hooves, looked into his mouth and even his ears. Tolly and the children stood by, watching anxiously. When the vet had finished, 
he had a talk with the children's father, and then drove off. Then the two children and their father and mother and Mr. Tolly went into the summer house for a good talk. What did he say, sir? What did you think about his hind legs? What did he think was wrong with him? <laughs> Just a minute, Tolly. Well, with careful handling, Brownie might be as good as ever in six months, but his hind legs are still too weak for work. Who's going to keep a horse for six months and then perhaps find he's no good at all? Would you tell Mr. Dinneford that? Perhaps he'll sell Brownie now while he's cheap, and I could buy him and go somewhere with him and get a job and look after him. I've given him my notice to Mr. Dinneford, and I intend to... Holly, stop a moment. I will buy Brownie, and you're very welcome to stay here and work for me and look after my other horses as well as Brownie, if you like. Sleep over the stable or in the shepherd's hut or wherever you please. Thank you kindly, sir. Peter, you're lucky you are. That's a real gentleman your father is. Just see that you grow up like him. You won't go far wrong then. I know, Mr. Tolly. Are you going to buy Branny for my father? That is if Mr. Dinneyford will sell him, of course. Young man, I haven't even fifty pounds to my name. What with paying rent and food and helping my invalid sister, but I shall ask your dad to keep back some of my wages each week so that when I've got a hundred pounds saved, I can buy Brownie for my very own. Oh, that's if Mr. Dinneyford will sell him. Mr. Tolly... Would you let us share Brownie with you if we paid half the hundred pounds for him? He's coming to live with us, so I'd like to think we could share him. You can share him whenever you like, when he's mine. You needn't pay me anything. But we must. We shouldn't feel he was half ours if we didn't pay something for him. We'll buy the bad legs part, and you can have the best part. (laughs) Well, whatever will you say next. Look, you save up and buy half if you really want to. I shan't be happy, though, till I can look at old Brownie and say to myself, You beauty, you're mine to look after for the rest of your life. There's something about horses that just gets me, and and old Brownie, well, he's... The best horse in the world. I feel like that about our dog Scamper, don't I, Scamper? (laughs) Well, now, if you've all finished saying nice things to each other, we'll go inside. Hello? Who's this? It's Mr. Dinneford. Daddy, don't let him take Brownie away. Of course not. Go indoors, you two children, and you can look out of the window. You stay here with me, Tolly. Right you are, sir. by stealing my horse. You said you were going to shoot him, so he's as good as dead, isn't he? He's my horse, and I can do what I like with him. Within reason, Dinneford, within reason. But that horse will never pull heavy loads again and is useless to you. Why don't you sell him for what you can get? But how do you know he's useless? We had the police vet here, and he didn't give a very good report. The police vet? Uh, What did he say? He said the horse wouldn't be a bit of use for some time, and you wouldn't get more than one hundred pounds for him. Hundred pounds? I paid three hundred. And who'd give me a hundred for a useless horse? I'll give you a hundred pounds. I'm fond of him and don't want to see him shot. You're a nincompoop if you think that horse is worth a hundred pounds. That horse should be shot. Right, Dinneford. If you don't want to sell him, take him away with you and go. Do you want to give me a hundred pounds? Are you stupid, too? Like Tolly here? I may be, but it's worth a hundred pounds to be rid of you. Take the horse with you or leave it here and take a hundred pounds, but make up your mind. All right, all right. I'll take the money. Right. Here's the cash. Thanks. And good riddance to a nuisance horse, I say. Good day to you. Well, Tolly, a horse is yours now. 
That is, if you want him. I'll deduct ten pounds a week from your wages until he's paid for. Thank you very much, sir. I think he'll be a fine horse one day, Tolly, with the care you'll give him. And you deserve to have him. Now go and bed him down in the stable. He'll be glad to have you fussing around him again, no doubt. As soon as Peter and Janet saw that Tolly was leading Brownie to the stables, they raced out of the house to him. While Brownie nuzzled both the children gently to show how he liked them, Tolly told them all that had happened. When he'd finished, the children could hardly contain their delight. We'll give you our share of the price as soon as we can, Mr Tolly. We've got some money in our money boxes, and Granny's coming next week. She always gives us about five pounds each. You don't need to pay me anything for your share of him. I'll willingly share him with you. Children who love horses like you do deserve half of my brownie. And look how he likes his new stable. He's settled in already. He'll be pleased when he goes into the fields. I bet he'll gallop all over the place and make friends with any animal there. Horse, sheep or dog. Your dad's been a real good sword over Brownie and Codger. I'm going back to Mr Dinneford's now and get my things. All right, Mr Tolly. We'll look after Brownie, so don't worry. Right you are. You stay quiet now, Brownie, and be careful of those back legs of yours. Lie down in your stable as much as you can, even if you do want to talk to the horse next to you. I'll be back to sleep alongside you tonight. Can't have anyone stealing you after what we've been through. See you all later. Goodbye, Cheers, Mr. Tolly. Mr. Tolly. Bye. That night, Tolly was very content to see that Brownie was safe and happy in his new stable. And taking an old mattress, he settled down to sleep in the empty stall next to his beloved horse. It was a job to see who was the happiest, Brownie, Codger or Tolly. The next morning, there was an extra special Secret Seven meeting, and by five to ten, all seven, plus Bob and Scamper, were seated round in the meeting shed, while Janet and Peter related what had happened the previous evening. Finally, Peter said, And that's about the whole story, except that Janet wants Branny to belong to everybody in the Secret Seven Club, instead of just us and Mr Tolly. I agree. And I'm sure the Secret Seven would be the only club in the world that owns half a horse. Yes, 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 brilliant. All right, now let's discuss money. Ah, there's Mr Tully out there. Janet, go and ask him to spare us a minute, please. All right, Peter. Mr Tully! Well, before he comes in, let's put all the money we've got on the table here. My purse has five pounds in it. I did some gardening for my granny. Oh, and I looked after old Mr K's dog. And he gave me seven pounds fifty. Oh, brilliant. Oh, here's Mr Tolly. Hello, Mr Tolly. What's all this about then, children? Please sit down, Mr Tolly. We've got some money towards the vet's fees. And we want to discuss the buying of brownie. Well, I... Whatever next... Well, we've got Pam and Jack's money. What about you, Colin? I took a dog for a walk, but he jumped in the river in the mud, so the owner only gave me £1.50. I had to give the dog a bath, too. Bad luck. What about you, Barbara? I've brought my money box with £9 in it. Good, but we still haven't got enough money to pay the vet's bills yet. But I've got some good news. Some weeks ago, I went in for an essay competition. And I heard this morning that I'd won the second prize of fifty pounds. <gasps> I haven't got it yet, but Dad let me have this fifty pound note, and I'll repay him when my money comes. So we've got it now towards the vet's fees. Good old well, 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 well. After that, mine doesn't sound much. It's only four pound fifty for running errands. It all counts, Bob. Now, Janet, with your money and mine, how much have we got? Um, we have the large sum of eighty-nine pounds. Hip hip hooray! Hip hip hooray! Hip hip hooray! We've got enough to pay the vet's fees and put something towards buying Brownie. Now look, I said I'm paying for him. He's my horse. You can't buy a horse in two halves. We'll each share the whole of him, and I'd be pleased to think you've a share of his love. Mr. Tolly, listen. We shan't feel as if we're really sharing him if we don't pay a part of him. All the club members feel the same. We'd all like to feel we've shares in such a lovely horse. 
but we know he's really yours. Just let us share him a bit. Oh, yes, we'd oh, love please, that, Mr. Please, Mr. Please, 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 Mr. Tolly. All right, I understand now. You pay me £50 down and you can reckon on your bit of him. Any money left over will pay off a bit of the vet's fees. That would be very kind of you and very helpful. When's Brownie's birthday, Mr. Tolly? With any money left over, we could buy him a whole bag of carrots. In about ten days' time. A bit of a thing he was, all legs and head. A bonny wee horse. Now look at him. As fine a horse as you ever did see. We might have time to go and see the vet now, before he goes on his rounds. That's a good idea, Janet. We'll take the money with us. Let's go, everybody. And you, Scamper. Come on. Okay, okay, go go on. Go on. They set off for Mr Whistler's house and were lucky enough to catch him as he was just going out for a ride on his own fine horse. He reined his horse in when he saw the eight children and a dog approaching. Hello, children. What can I do for you? It's just to tell you we've saved up the money to pay your bill for the horse called Brownie. You know the one with the bad legs? Mr Dinniford has sold it to my father and now my father has sold it to Mr Tolly who's left Mr Dinniford and is working for my father. It's all a bit complicated, I'm afraid. I know the horse well. A cart ran into him and hurt his legs. I was angry with Dinniford about that. He always overworks his horses. That horse suffered a lot. How are his legs now? Much better now that Mr Tolly's with us and looking after him. And Mr Tolly told us that you did a lot for Brownie's poor legs. And now you've been kind enough to halve the bill. So we've come to pay it. And Mr Tolly won't have to worry any more. We've got enough money because we've all saved up. And George won £50 and gave it towards your fees and towards buying a share in Brownie. We're all going to share him, so he'll be jolly well looked after. Well, I'm blessed. So that's what you've come for. Now look, I suppose you wouldn't let me have a share in that horse, would you? If I had a share, I could come and look after him for nothing. If anything went wrong, couldn't I? Well... As you've done so much for Brownie's poor old back legs, I'm sure Mr Tully would like you to have a share in him. Yes, and if you can tell us exactly how much we owe you for the bill, we could pay... Good gracious! As if I would charge anything for looking after a horse in which I own a share. But you didn't have a share when you attended him. Quite right. But I didn't know I was going to be lucky enough to have a share then, did I? No. If I have a share in Brownie, there'll be no fees to pay for my attending him when his legs were so bad. I wouldn't hear of it. Well, I must go. Goodbye. And give Brownie a part for me. Gee up. Well, that's that. What a wonderful thing to happen. Good old Mr Whistler. He's a sport. Just think. If Brownie gets anything wrong with him, he'll get free treatment with no more big bills for Mr Tolly to worry about. Pam, what's the matter? What on earth are you crying for? <laughs> it's just that I'm so happy all of a sudden. I don't know why I'm crying. I just can't help it. And don't look so worried, Scamper. I tell you, I am very happy. The children all went back to Peter's house as fast as they could. They could hardly believe their good luck. Tolly couldn't believe it either, and it took some time to persuade him that they were telling the truth. When he finally realised what had happened, he flopped down on a chair, speechless with amazement. Peter and Janet went to tell their father what the vet had said. And when they had finished their story, Peter made a suggestion. So we'd like you to take the money now to pay for Brownie, so that Mr Tully can have him really and truly. Very well. I'll take the money, and it shall all be spent on Brownie. And the first thing we'll buy is a good saddle for when his legs are better. He'd like that. Oh, so would we. I know, Daddy. Let him be yours and Tolly's horse when we are at school, and our horse when we are on holiday. That's fair enough, isn't it? More than fair. Now go and tell your mother about it, and I'll have a word with Tolly and tell him the arrangements we've made. Tolly was as pleased as anyone else about the new arrangement, knowing it would do Brownie good to have someone riding him every day. Everyone went to bed early that night, and very soon they were all fast asleep, except for Janet, who stayed awake reading an exciting book. When the big clock downstairs struck eleven, she put out her light and gazed out at the bright, warm, moonlit night. 
Then she decided that she must go outside for a moment. She called Scamper in a whisper, and they both set off silently down the stairs and out into the yard. Come on, Scamper. Let's go and see if old Brownie is awake. He'll be so pleased to see us. And keep in the shadows, in case Mummy and Daddy look out of their window. What's the matter, Scamper? Why are you tugging at my dressing gown? What is it? A rat? I can't see anything. What's that? Don't bark or growl, Scamper. Keep close to me, and I'll peep in at the stable windows. Now be quiet. Be quiet. Come on, come on, move out, will you? Quick, Scamper, back to the house. Mummy, Daddy, quick! Someone is stealing the horses. Tolly's fighting them. Daddy, Daddy! Her father and mother awoke at once, and her father raced downstairs in his pajamas. While her mother, after telephoning the police, grabbed a poker and dashed down to the stables to join them. Janet rushed in and woke up Peter, who could hardly believe what was happening, until they were in the yard and could hear awful noises coming from the stables. After what seemed like ages, but was really only a few minutes, the police arrived, and Janet and Peter rushed them down to the stables. And what a turmoil there was! Their father was sitting firmly on top of one horse thief, and Tolly on another, hitting him well and truly. And there was a third one on his knees in front of Mother, begging her to let him go. Codger and Scamper were having a wonderful time too, snapping at the men who were scared stiff by now. Let go of me! All right, sir, madam, we'll take them now. Come on, you lot. Yeah, you keep those dogs off me. And that brown horse, he kicked me, nearly broke me ankle. A lot of savages in here, all of them, human and animals. Serve you right. Well done, everybody. Are the horses hurt? Oh, they're all right. Old Brownie actually enjoyed the shindy. I think the way he kicked out at those thieves. <laughs> oh. We'll take these three villains away now, then, and I'll be in touch with you in the morning. Well done, everybody. Come on, you lot. Well, now that's over. What happened exactly, Tolly? Well, I bedded down in the straw next to Old Brownie. See, it was all quiet. And sometime later on, old Brownie here whinnied right in my ear, leaned over my stall as if he wanted to whisper. Then I sat up and heard a noise, not a horse noise, a man noise. I thought to myself, "Oh, here we go, horse thieves, or I'll eat my old cap." What then? Well, I got up and I saw a man undoing the latch of Major's stall up there. An old Major was kicking and snorting, and then I saw two more men. So I picked up that old pitchfork and went for him, and one of them won't be able to sit down for a week. He won't. <laughs> then I saw one of them catch hold of my old brownie, so I told old brownie to swing round and kick out, and he did. Always does what he's told, does old brownie. And my word, he sent two of them flying, and, and one hit his head against the door. Boy, didn't he howl? And bless me, the boss here and his wife came in like magic, and by the time the police arrived. It was all over.、Oh, you've done a grand job tonight, Tolly, and I hope you'll regard yourself as head of stables now. I can do with a man like you here. Now you see to the horses and quieten them down, and we'll all go back to bed. It's been an extraordinary night for everybody. There was no need to call a secret seven meeting the next morning. The news of the horse thieves had gone round the village, and all the members rushed to the little meeting house to find out what had happened. The members sat round as Peter and Janet told them all about the night's adventure. Then Peter smiled as they finished the story. And the fresh news is that the thieves took three of Mr. Dinnyford's horses before they came here, and nobody knows where they are yet. Well, he lost Tolly through his nastiness, and now he's lost his horses. Will they be all right? Oh yes, they're too expensive to be ill-treated by thieves, but goodness knows who has them. Serve him right. I think we all feel like that. Peter, did you find out when Brownie's birthday is? Yes, next Friday. Dad says we can hold a proper party for him in the yard, and make a really good day of it for Brownie and Tolly. And I think we ought to ask Bob too. It was he who told us about Brownie and Tolly. Yes. Oh, good. Oh, yes, it was Bob. Good old Bob. 
And Dad thinks we should buy a decent saddle for Brownie. Then Mr Tolly can ride in comfort. And he says he will put some money towards the saddle too, as he feels so grateful for Tolly saving our horses last night. Jolly deeds, oh, nice. Well, well, good good idea. Idea. That is very nice. And that is why they are now all sitting down at a long table in the stable yard. Brownie's birthday has arrived. He is 13 years old today, though he doesn't know it, and wonders what all the fuss is about. Hanging in the stable is a fine new saddle which Peter and Janet's father and the children bought for Mr Tolly. And he's so proud of it, he can hardly wait to put it on Brownie's back and ride him. There's a birthday cake too with Happy Birthday Brownie on it. And there Brownie stands, his big brown eyes as kind as ever, his coat shining beautifully. And he's eating a sugar lump and a handful of best corn from Tolly's horny hand. A very nice titbit. <laughs> he's saying thanks. Mr Tolly, I really do think he's the nicest horse in the world. You're right there, Janet. You're right. <laughs> and he says... He reckons there's no children like you anywhere, either. 